We're coming up on it right now. The team is diving the wreck of an unidentified aircraft in search of an iconic Bermuda Triangle mystery. We got another one. They have found what appear to be 1940s era aircraft engines. If we could put a positive ID on this one, then um, that would be a win for us. But the condition of the wreck is making that identification difficult. This would be a lot easier if there wasn't so much incrustation all over it. So as we're going around the site, and you're seeing just scraps of metal. Then you get into the main heart of it. And you're seeing three engines. They found three out of four engines from a 1940s era plane. But there's no smoking gun yet. They head back to shore and regroup with the rest of the team. David O'Keefe joins via video chat from the mainland. We have multiple engines, but we haven't been able to find any plates or any identifiable features yet. And that's the problem. This site is so scrambled. It's just really chaotic down there. There's just too much damage to make a definitive ID. They need another dive. Meanwhile, Jason Harris is still investigating. He's located a retired pilot named Peter Wilson. Peter grew up around the island's military airfields. This airport here was a military airport built by the United States Army. One incident stands out in Peter's memory. And the one guy said, look, there's something wrong with an airplane. We looked up, and there was tumbling out of the sky. October 20th, 1963. A US Air Force plane, the KB-50J, takes off from Bermuda. Something goes horribly wrong. Then it um, impacted the water and um, crashed off the western end of the island. Oh, wow. The western end of the island is exactly where the team is investigating. It was a KB-50, and we could hear that because you know, large piston engines, and they put uh, turbojets jets just outside of the um, outboard engines. The KB-50J was a hybrid World War II B-29 bomber with two jet engines grafted on to make it a high-speed tanker. The result was a Frankenstein plane with a distinctive sound that Peter remembers. You could hear them roaring around. With so many clues pointing in so many different directions, the team decides to try something they've never done before. They're going to take Jason underwater. I think it's going to be invaluable. If he sees something he's familiar with, intimate with, that's going to help us identify this, this wreck site. It actually gives me a little bit of anxiety. You know, my place is up in the sky. It's flying airplanes. The biggest thing with a new diver is just making sure their comfort level is like they're good to go and that they feel safe and taken care of, uh, especially with that surge action. Dive, dive, dive. As an aviator, being able to see an aircraft wreck, knowing that people perished, that's very humbling and it's very sobering. There's so many thoughts that are going through my head. What were those last moments like? I want to know what the rest of the story of that aircraft wreckage is. As time runs out, Barnett spots a shine in the sand. It appears to be glass. And there's a distinct curve to the structure. Back on shore, they dial in David O'Keefe once more. It was a phenomenal dive. I think the most critical piece we came across, you can see the curvature on one end of it. I actually realized this is part of the cockpit. I think we'll be able to overlay that with a picture of a KB-50J 
and it's gonna be a perfect match. The team also made measurements of the propeller blades, nine feet each, a perfect match for the KB-50J. It all points to one conclusion. So where's your level of confidence on this as a positive ID? Well, based on what we saw down there, I'm pretty confident that this is that KB-50J. 60 years after Peter Wilson watched it fall out of the sky, the team has found evidence that this wreck is the Air Force's Frankenstein tanker plane, the KB-50J. I say we, we could call this one a win, I would think. No, oh, good job, boys, good job. As they leave Bermuda behind, there remains only one final question. How did it crash? Back on the mainland, Barnett has a lead on an answer, a survivor. Hey, Bill. Hi. Glad hey. to meet you at last. Bill yeah, Tilton was me. the co-pilot of the uh, KB-50J. Well, Call right sign there. Yeah, Sheba the... 80. He has never seen the crash site until now. That is interesting. But he immediately recognizes Sheba 80. That's just spooky to see that. 117. When I did the pre flight, I noticed that the jet intakes were rusty. We got a lot of salt spray. We took off at full power. And uh, the left wheel operator happened to be looking right at that jet engine. He saw that tail cone just separate and immediately burst into flame. The explosion of the jet engine could explain why the team found only three of the plane's six engines. The aircraft commander, Curly Moore, on the left side, said to me, we'll bail out. It was that quick, he didn't hesitate. So I threw off my headset, took my head and rolled forward into the opening. And the parachute opened very nicely and then everything's peaceful. For Bill Tilton, the memories are still powerful. I got on Curly Moore's crew and uh, that made me really happy because I not only liked him, but he was an instructor pilot. The body of Captain John Curley Moore was recovered. The other casualty that day, Staff Sergeant Charles Kriegler, has never been found. The team came to Bermuda to investigate one of the Triangle's most iconic mysteries. Now they have helped write the final chapter of a crashed American military plane and the two heroes who went down with it.